Good morning. Welcome to Grace Fellowship. We're going to do a, starting off with some praise songs. We're going to start off with You Are Holy. You are holy. You are holy. You are mighty. You are worthy. You are worthy. Worthy of praise. Worthy of praise. I will follow. I will follow. I will listen. I will listen. I will love you. I will love you all of my days. All my days. I will sing. The King who is worthy, I remember Him. I adore Him. I will bow down before Him. I will sing to and worship the King who is worthy. I For him, you're my prince of peace. I will live my life for you. You are holy. You are holy. You are mighty. You are mighty. You are worthy. You are worthy. Worthy of I will follow. I will follow. I will listen. I will listen. I will love you. I will love you. All of my days. All of my days. I you will sing to and worship the King who is worthy. I will love Him. Jesus in there. Prince of Peace, you're holy. Okay, we're going to do Awake My Soul. When I close my eyes, I can see glory when I raise my hands I can touch your face when I bow my knees I stand 
for you and Christ is born in me awake my soul prepare an entrance for your glory and let my heart become a throne for you to dwell and when I need your Holy Spirit more than life itself then Christ is born in me when I lose myself reflect your image when I break break my will then I am whole when I give give my all I find life everlasting then Christ is born is formed in me awake my soul awake my soul prepare an entrance for your glory and let my heart become a throne for you to dwell and when I need your Holy Spirit Then Christ is born in me. Awake, my soul, prepare an entrance for your glory. And let my heart become a throne for you to dwell. need your Holy Spirit more than life itself, then Christ is born in me. Be formed in me. I'm just an empty vessel. Be formed in me. Amen, amen. Awake my soul. Great song. Okay, we're going to break out of him. I stand amazed. stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me a sinner condemned unclean how marvelous how wonderful song shall ever be how marvelous how wonderful is my Savior's love for me he took my sins and my sorrows he made them his best
marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. Is my Savior's love for me. How marvelous this love is. Okay. Going to end up with how great is our God. The splendor of a king Clothed in majesty Let all the earth rejoice All the earth rejoice He wraps himself in light And darkness tries to hide Trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice. How great is our God. Sing with me, how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great. To age she stands And time is in his hands Beginning and the end Beginning and the end The Godhead three in one Father, Spirit, Son God, 
say with me how great is our God and all will see of all names. How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And all will see how great how great is our God. Do that again. How great Sing with me how great is our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God, how great is our God, sing with me how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you are a, a great and awesome God. Name above all names. There is no other above you. Your name is above anything that we can come up, any of our sickness, our diseases, COVID-19, your name is above that. You are at the beginning. You're at the end. There is no beginning for you. You've always been. How great is our God. We thank you, Lord, that we can depend on you each and every day of our lives. We can teach our children that you will be there each and every day of their lives. How great is our God. We thank you so much, Lord, that you are the King of kings, the Lord of lords. You love us. You want that relationship with us. It's hard for us to comprehend that a mighty God would want to have a relationship with us. But you do. And you desire it. And that's what makes you a great God. We thank you so much and we love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We're on the Word of God. And we want to stick with the Word of God. Uh, what I've got to say to you it doesn't mean anything unless the Word of God says it. And uh, so I urge you, uh, don't just take my word for it. Uh, be Bereans, look up the Scripture, and see if these things be so. Uh, here at Grace, uh, we don't emphasize numbers, we don't emphasize membership. Uh, you're a member of the body of Christ, you uh, are a part of us, and we rejoice in that. Uh, for visitors, uh, I think back on the table, I don't know whether they're back on this table or not, but we have a statement of faith that are out if you'd like to see one, but they are available. I'm going to do something this morning I've never done before, and I may regret it, <laughs> uh, hopefully not. Um, I want to talk about uh, the measure of a man. The measure of a man. To, to fully understand what we face today as humans in a world that seems to have gone wild, we need to understand what we're dealing with. First, it, it seems to me that we need to understand why we exist. Why are we here? A lot of people, you know, go through life never thinking about why they exist. Well, oftentimes they're told in school, well, to improve your community or to, to improve society or, uh, you know, 
uh, help your fellow man and all of this kind of thing. But when they come right down to it and they get up in years, they begin to ask the question, well, what in the world am I doing here? Why are we here? Well, as I mentioned the last time that I, I spoke to you, the Westminster Confession holds that the chief end and goal of man is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Now, if we were placed here to glorify God, then it only follows that I understand who He is, but not just who, but what He is. Uh, I've defined glorify in the past. To glorify God is to make known and accepted the character or person of a person or thing. It's to make known His character. What's His character? What do we know about God? Now, if, if God formed man in His own image, then ought we not to be like Him? in his attributes, in who he is, his character? Is not our character supposed to reflect who God is? So today, I want to get a picture of the character of God. Now once we capture that picture, then we have the measuring device for what we were created to be like. On the final analysis, we should be able to clearly understand what went wrong and why we're struggling with it today. Only then can we find the solution to man's dilemma. And isn't that why we're all here today? to find solutions to man's problems, our problems, as human beings. I guess it really throws into question, why, why do we attend church? Why do, we, why do we come to a church? Well, I think it's got something to do with finding out what God's like, so I can be like Him. Then I suddenly find out I can't be like him. Try as I might, I might try and work and work and work and like Ben Franklin, put some kind of attribute down on a calendar and work on it for a month and then move on to the next character trait that I need to work on. And, but you'll never get there. Not like that. What you're going to find out is you can't. But we're going to see that even more so today. So I would declare this morning that the character of God is the measuring rod for man, for you and for me. So what is the character of God and how did man not live up to it? Now, <laughs> here's where I got to be careful. I've never done this before, but I'm, I'm going to let scripture speak for itself. And where I normally have just two lines of references for Ken to put up here that you can read, today he's got three, got a lot of passages. So follow along. I don't want you writing these things down. I want you to look up here. I've got them here on the sheet so that you can take it home with you if you want afterwards. But I want you to follow with me to take a look, first of all, at the character of God. There, there are, and we're in our study, of the book of Romans. And that outline is up here as well if you haven't gotten one yet. <clears throat> but in the book of Romans, there are at least 18 attributes of God. 18. Now, that, that's just touching the surface of who He is. First of all, Romans chapter 1, verse 4. He's holy. 
who was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead, according to the Spirit of holiness. Jesus Christ, our Lord. God is holy. Now, I've defined holy in the past. Most of you have heard it before. But to be holy, he is so different that there is nothing by which he can be compared. Now, that's regardless of the attribute, <laughs> regardless of the character trait, there's nothing, absolutely nothing, to which he can be compared. That means he is holy. Whoa, the Word of God tells us that we are a holy nation. That is the people of God. You and I are supposed to be so different that there's nothing by which we can be described by the world. That ought not to strike you as strange, but it's true. Romans 1, 4, declared to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead, according to the spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord. In verses 1 through 6, same chapter, he's omniscient. Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets, in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, who was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh, who was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead according to the Spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for his name's sake, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. Going over to chapter 8 and verse 29, we read, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed. Wow. Conformed to the image of his Son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. That is priority. He's omniscient. He knows all things. He knows what's going on in your mind right now. He knew it last week, what you were going to think this morning. You've had decisions you've had to make this past week. He's known all about it. He's known about it a long time ago. He's known about you and your presence in this world before he ever formed this world. That, wow. That's powerful. Isn't that, isn't that great? Do you realize, just to stop and think about that, that he's omniscient, he knows all things, he knows what's going on? It brings me great comfort because Sometimes I have no idea what's going on. And I'm blown away by my own ignorance. <laughs> but God knows. God knows. So I can quit worrying and stewing over what's going on in my life. Secondly, I find he's om omnipotent in chapter 1, verse 20. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. Chapter 4, verse 21. And being fully assured that what God had promised, he was also able, he was able also to perform. He is omnipotent. Now, if he knows all things and he knows what's going on in your life, or he knows what's going on in your loved one's life, he's all powerful. He can take care of it. Can he not? That ought to, that ought to give us great assurance. 
By the way, God has never slept through anything that's taken place in your life. He neither sleeps nor slumbers. Boy, that's good news. No matter how bad things may look, no matter how tough it may get, he knows, and he's all-powerful. He can take care of it. He'll do it. Do you really believe that? If you believe that, then let go. Turn loose. Let God have his way in your life. Fourth, he's gracious. He's gracious. He's full of grace. Chapter 1, verses 5 through 7. Through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for his name's sake, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ to all who are beloved of God in Rome, called as saints. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He's gracious. Chapter 4, verse 16. For this reason, it is by faith, in order that it may be in accordance with grace, so that the promise will be guaranteed to all the descendants, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who are the father of us all. Further, chapter 5, verses 15 and 17. But the free gift is not like the transgression. For if by the transgression of the one many died, much more did the grace of God and the gift of grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abound to the many. For if by the transgression of the one death reigned through the one, much more those who received the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. He's gracious. Chapter 11, verse 5. In the same way, then, there has also come to be, at the present time, a remnant according to God's gracious, gracious choice. <laughs> Let me ask you. Do you feel chosen today? If you know Jesus Christ is your personal Savior, you are chosen. You have been chosen. And God did that all without your help. He didn't need you to sign on the bottom line. He was being gracious. He was being omniscient. He was being omnipotent. He was being, he was being full of grace towards you. Fifth, he's a, he's a God of love. Now we all know that. We've heard it over and over again. Chapter 1, verse 7, to all who beloved who are beloved of God in Rome called as saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Chapter 5, verse 5, And who, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our, within our hearts. Whose hearts? Our hearts. Through the Holy Spirit who has given, who was given to us. But God demonstrates, verse 8, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In Romans chapter 8 and verses 37 to 39, but in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor things present nor things to come nor powers, nor height, nor debt, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. What comfort that ought to be for us. It ought to be a, 
moment of euphoria in our lives. He loves us. And there's absolutely nothing that can separate you from that. Nothing. Certainly not you. Nothing that's going on in this world can separate you. That's what he said. He loves you. God so loved the world. You're part of that world. He loves you. Sixth, he's righteous. He's righteous. Chapter 1, verse 17. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. Chapter 3, verses 21 to 24. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. Chapter 10, verse 3, for not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. You don't know why there's problems in the world, in your world and mine? There is. Unwilling to subject ourselves to the righteousness of God trying to establish our own. What is that? We talked about this in the Bible study this morning. It's pride. It's pride. Seventh, he's just. He is just. Chapter 1, verse 19. Because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. Verses 26 to 28. For this reason, God gave them over to, disre de over to degrading passions, for their women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural, and in the same way also the men abandoned the natural function of the woman and burned in their desire toward one another, men with men, committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper. You want to know what's going on in the world? There it is. Chapter 2, verse 2. And we know that the judgment of God rightly falls upon those who practice such things. On the day when, according to my gospel, God will judge the secrets of men through Christ Jesus. Chapter 3, verses 25 and 26. Whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God he passed over the sins previously committed. For the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time, so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Chapter 5, verse 9. Much more then, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. Chapter 14, verses 10 through 10, 12. But you... Why do you judge your brother? Or you again, why do you regard your brother with contempt? For we will all stand before the judgment knee, uh, before the judgment seat. Knee, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall give praise to God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord. Every I got something mixed up here. Every tongue shall give praise to God. So then each one of us will give an account of himself to God. Chapter 8, I can't read that back there. <laughs> All right. 
He's eternal. He's eternal. There's no ending. There's no beginning. Chapter 1, verse 23, and exchange the glory of the incorruptible, undying, that means undying God, for an image in the form of the corruptible or dying man and a bird's four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Chapter 16, verse 26, but now is manifested and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the eternal God has been made known to all the nations leading to obedience of faith. Ninth, he is a God of truth. Chapter 1, verse 25, for they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Chapter 16, verse 26, but now is manifested by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the eternal God has been made known to all the nations leading to obedience of faith. Tenth, he's, he's a son of, he is a son of wrath, chapter 2, verse 5. But because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Chapter 5, verse 9. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. And chapter 11, verse 22, Behold then the kindness and severity of God to those who fell, severity, but to you, God's kindness. If you continue in his kindness, otherwise you also will be cut off. Chapter 12, verse 19, Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. He is also faithful, faithful. Chapter 3, verse 3, What then, if some did not believe, their unbelief will not nullify the faithfulness of God, will it? Chapter 8, verse 28, And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. I find He's also a God of truth. In chapter 3, verse 4, May it never be, rather let God be found true, though every man be found a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. He's also full of glory. Chapter 3, verse 23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Chapter 6, verse 4, Therefore we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so that we too all might walk in newness of life. He's also a God of peace. Chapter 5, verse 1, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Chapter 15, verse 33, Now the God of peace be with you all. Chapter 16, verse 20, The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. He's also merciful. Chapter 9, verse 16 to 18. So then, it does not depend on the man who wills or the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, For this very purpose I raised you up to demonstrate my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed throughout the whole earth. So then, he has mercy on whom he desires, and he hardens whom he desires. Chapter 11, verse 22. Behold, then, the kindness and severity of God to those who fell. Severity, but to you, God's kindness, if you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. Verses 30 through 32, same chapter. For just as you once were disobedient to God, but now have been shown mercy because of their disobedience, so that these also now have been disobedient, that because of the mercy shown to you, they also may be shown mercy. For God has shut up all in disobedience, so that he may show mercy to all. He is sovereign. He is sovereign. Chapter 9, verse 1 through chapter 11, verse 29. I'm going to read all of that. But the sovereignty is shown by his choice of Israel to be his holy nation. 
I find he's a God of wisdom and knowledge. Chapter 11, verse 33, oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. I find he's also a God of hope. Chapter 15, verse 13, you may, now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace and believing so that you will be uh, so that you will abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now this only scratches the surface of God's character. I personally believe we are going to continue to learn more about God's character throughout eternity. I don't think we'll ever stop learning about God. Now why do, why do I take us through this kind of an exercise? You may be sitting there wondering why you're going through all these passages of Scripture. Oh, sometimes the scripture can speak it better than what man can speak it, but certainly better than I can speak it. We talked about it this morning in the Bible class. One of the first things that we're told in, in, in the command of the Lord Jesus in Matthew 28, verse 20, is that they teach them to become disciples. They teach the word. And we're told that they were uh, steadfast in the word, uh, in the doctrine. Uh, doctrine simply means teaching. And so these things are to be taught. These, these are important. They're not some just some list taken out of nowhere. They are things that we are to learn about God and find ourselves in the picture and how we measure up. So having taken a look at that rather quickly, as quickly as I could, allow me to touch upon the failure of mankind and the root of all of our problems. I want to take a look at the downward spiral of man in uh, the verses before us in Romans, uh, beginning in verse 14, chapter 1. Uh, the last time I preached, I attempted to answer the question, what is sin? In its definition, we saw clearly the contrast between who or what God is and man's failure. Uh, it becomes even more stark in the light of what we've just looked at in terms of the attributes of God. It's uh, the contrast between black on white, if you please. Uh, as we read this, as we read this first paragraph, we will notice the successive stages in man's departure from God. And I pick it up in verse 18 of chapter 1 of Romans. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are, uh, I'm missing something there. Being understood through what he has been made so that they are without excuse. Okay. Uh, I skipped something here. Verse 21 to 22. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man, of birds, four footed animals, crawling creatures. Now, the culmination of the process is the worship of idols. Uh, is, it's clearly seen in the uh, nations of antiquity as well as in the pagan societies or cultures of today. 
the deification of animals uh, were uh, especially prominent in ancient Egypt and Babylonia. The deification of men uh, was prominent in the empires of Greece and Rome. And these willful acts of men were followed by the abandonment of God, of, by man, of God. Now, that's not changed. Uh, we see on every side in our society this pushing, trying to get God out of everything. And so we find man continuing these, these pressing issues. Uh, I would have us to notice in Romans chapter 1, verses 24, 26, and 28, a repeated phrase, God gave them over. And I think the King James says God gave them up. But God gave them over. Now here's the principle of all divine judgment. It will seem to conflict with the sovereignty of God. However, God in his wisdom has placed them in perfect order. Now, I may not understand it, but God has a full understanding of it. But here we find that from a human standpoint, God allows man to make a choice. So if one persists in his sin, judgment falls, and he or she is confirmed in their evil state. Now, I want that to soak in for a minute. Now, here I can probably illustrate it best with Pharaoh. After God had requested through Moses that the people, children of Israel, be released to go worship God, he kept denying, kept denying, kept denying, until he, God, it says God hardened his heart. Uh, let's look at this downward spiral. First in Romans chapter 1, verse 24. Therefore God gave them over in the lust of their hearts to impurity. So this resulted in the dishonoring of the body. That's what you've got going on today. It's a hot topic in our society. Romans chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. For this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions. For their women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural. Verse 28, and just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper. So a lengthy list of sinful acts follows. And it really illustrates the truth of Jeremiah's words in Jeremiah 17, 9, as you look at it. The heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? Moral corruption, stemming from the sin of idolaters, assumes many forms. Yet it reflects the same principle. Man without God is lost in a sea of human sin, and one sin leads to another. The outworking of the evil nature is God's judgment against a human will in a state of rebellion. It, and it's against such wickedness says Paul in Romans 1.18, that for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Now as God is holy, he cannot countenance sin. He can't have anything to do with it. He can't have it in his presence. Since the life of the flesh is in the blood, the only way to a restored fellowship was through the blood. And this he did by offering his own precious son as our substitute for all of our sins. The 
You know, I, I go through these character traits of God. And I can, I can only say praise God that he's like this. Because being a God who is gracious, he knew that you and I would never seek him. We just wouldn't. In sin, we seek our own, not him. But in his grace, he made a way whereby the sin could be atoned for and a relationship restored or brought into being between us and him. And he did that for you and me. This God, with a character such as we've described today, or that the scripture has described today, cares about you. Isn't that wonderful? You know, that ought, to, that ought to encourage us. It ought to give us a thankful heart. We used to sing the song, count your many blessings, name them one by one. See what God has done. The greatest blessing of all is that you have a relationship with God. And it was only possible because God loves you and was willing to give himself on your behalf. Romans chapter 5, verse 6, for while we were still helpless, that's me, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Romans chapter 5 and verses 8 and 9, but God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. Now herein is the gospel message. The good news, if you please. Now, Romans, the book of Romans, I think is a foundational book to New Testament Christianity. It is filled with doctrine. And one of the desires, because I acknowledge my time is short, my opportunities are limited, but I want to give to you as much as I can possibly give so that you might know and understand how great this love is and what this relationship means and ought to mean for each of us. And they could sound like so many words. It could sound like a litany of just verses. But in it, I hear the heartbeat of God. And His heartbeat is for you. These passages that we've looked at here today have instruct us not only in what we are to believe, but why? Why? And I trust that all of you here today have come to the cross, trusted in the shed blood of the Lord Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. If you have not, I urge you to make that decision today. If you need help, Scott and I are available after the service. But don't kid yourself. You may have been going to church all your life. 
and you may never have come to a realization of what Christ did for you on the cross and accepted it as your own. And without that, it is appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment. Now you can wait until then or you can wait and come now and have your sins judged on the cross and the blood sacrifice of the Lord Jesus to take away the sin. The option is yours. Thank you for being patient. Thank you for allowing me to take us through an exercise that may have seemed awful long at times. But if you can't get a hold of it and enjoy it now, how are you going to enjoy eternity in learning more and more about God? Let's pray. Father, We're so inadequate when it comes to trying to explain your purposes. And it's only by the instruction of your Holy Spirit that we can get a hold of the truth, bind our hearts with it. Grant, Father, that in this hour our hearts may be drawn ever closer to you. We love you and we thank you for the sacrifice that was made on our behalf on the cross of Calvary. Forgive us for our complacency Forgive us, Lord, for our laziness in our Christianity. Forgive us, Lord, for our silence. And grant that we may be disciple makers, that we may go forth to share your love with all that we meet. Thank you for our time together. Thank you for your word and its instruction. Thank you for loving us so. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.